That's why he's not finished with his books, but he's coming. Um, it's there. This is Arthur. This is Francisco. Hey there. Hi, how are you? It's there. But it is reversed. Mm, do you see it reversed? It, it's no, see, right, no, right, it's right there. Yeah. This is this. But it is. Could it be anywhere between nine and ten? Wow. Oh, so you're not a No. Okay. So I don't think it's like. I mean, you can look at it as self sustaining, but. That's all the weather. It's summer. Tonight, this, that will be the topic. Jane, 
Games is an Amazon.com best-selling author of historical fiction and complete current intelligence review and history, including Secrets of Washington County, Battlefield Angels, and this is one I don't know how to say. Canalers. Canalers. That's a hard thing. No, that's a crawling no, that's the way that's the way it used to sound. Can't hear? Okay. That's the way they said it sounded like uh, when Canaller said Canaller. They said it sounded like Canaller. Canaller. All right. Um, right. He also writes fantasy, horror, and little grave novels. And they are random. He has received more than two thousand awards for article writing and advertising and copywriting. And Secrets of Franklin County will be out in April. This is his website, PageRated.com. Before you leave, I will also tell you about, well, I'll just tell you now. The next lecture will be April 10th. That's also a Monday. You're on your calendar. That's 7. And you'll have a local historian, John Schilt, who will discuss the 29th Infantry Division in World War II. Men of the 29th came from Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and other communities locally that just a few generations earlier had sent soldiers to both the Union and Confederate mm -hmm. armies in the Civil War. That's why the 29th also became known as the Blue and Gray Division. So that will be on Monday, April 10th at 7. I see you all there. And now I think we will let our speaker get started. Maybe turn a few lights down and well, see if everybody, everybody, everybody see fine. No, we don't need them down. Don't need them? No. Wait, you just have one. Thank you. Is this microphone working? Yes. Yeah, good. It is. Okay. Thanks for having me out today. Um, I actually thought it was 7 so I was running, running a little bit late without even realizing it. But um, I guess just to start out, for all its secrets, Washington County is um, it's very obvious. It's not unique in the fact that there are 31 Washington counties in the United States. Um, however, and well, this actually doesn't even count Washington, D.C., which is uh, a district and cities and things like that, uh, and a state, but um, 31 other Washington counties. And this, though, is the very first place. This was the place that came up with the idea of naming a county after Washington, even before he was president. Um, they, the, your early predecessors were inspired by this young country's desire for independence. And so um, they wanted to, when they broke off in September of 1776, they decided to name themselves after the general who was giving their freedom. Now, the second Washington County, which is in Virginia, wouldn't actually come to be until three months later. And although New York and Rhode Island have Washington counties, and when you glance at those counties' founding dates, they may look older than Washington County, Maryland. However, they were originally named something else. So the very first Washington County was here. Uh, and then there's also a few that aren't even in existence anymore. One Washington County is now part of uh, the one in North Dakota. It's now part of three different counties. So uh, Washington County, Maryland still persists and still continues. Uh, it also has the first completed Washington Monument. Uh, the one in Baltimore started before the one here, but you guys got this one done quicker. So this is the district named after Washington, early map of. And this is 
what a few towns in Washington County might have been. Because there were three towns in this county that were actually considered as sites for the national capital. Um, so, first Congress they met in 1789. Uh, one, of the, one of the decisions they had to make is where were they going to base the federal government? And they, they kind of set out guidelines, but gave the final decision to Washington himself. Uh, so they, uh, you know, there were a lot of places that were considered, of course, New York City, um, Princeton, New Jersey, uh, York, PA, and of course, New York and uh, let's say Philadelphia, York, PA, Harrisburg, they had all served as temporary national capitals. So they were certainly in the run. But then Congress kind of tied it to being within, uh, along the, the watershed for the Potomac River. Uh, as part of their, part of that deal between Ham, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson uh, that led to um, the creation of a national bank and uh, it got the national capital agreed to be sited closer to the south. So they, um, Congress agreed in 1790 that the capital needed to be along 80, somewhere along 80 miles of the Potomac River from the Anacostia River uh, mouth all the way out to Williamsburg. It had to be somewhere along there. So, of course, Washington County wanted to get in on that. Uh, back then, having your city be the site of government ensured a lot of business in that city. And so you had uh, three places here that were trying to uh, vie for the intention of Washington. Um, you had Hagerstown, of course, uh, Boonesboro, and Williamsport. And they all, uh, as Washington made his way along, uh, checking out all the cities that were trying to become the national capital, uh, including Shepherdstown. They also put in a bid. Uh, he came and he was treated very well. Uh, they uh, wined and dined him when he came out here, uh, all three cities. Um, unfortunately though, um, or maybe might be a blessing in disguise, most people think he really had his mind made up because Mount Vernon was down near the area that was allowed to be considered. And of course, he knew that that would bring a lot of commerce into uh, that area. So uh, he chose that DC area. The other problem he might have been considering, uh, given that, given his history with the um, canal company, that Great Falls. I mean, back then, if you had a big city like that, and the fact that they wanted it along the Potomac River, they wanted it to be a port city, so stuff could be brought in, taken out to the ocean. And Great Falls would have messed that up royally, and he knew that. So, um, you know, even though on the maps, Washington County was in the running, in Washington's mind, probably not. Um, so he actually chose um, to take the site where it is. And it was designed to be 10 square miles. So actually it's probably pretty good that it wasn't here because it would have almost pretty much split the state at this point. Uh, and you might've had uh, Garrett and Allegheny County becoming part of West Virginia or uh, uh, Pennsylvania, because it would have been hard, you know, the capital city would have bisected Maryland in that spot. So, 
So you all probably know your big Civil War battle here, Battle of Antietam. But do you know there was a second Battle of Antietam fought here? And it was in 1924. Uh, at that time, in August of that year, August 25th, 3,000 Marines set out from Quantico. Uh, they voted themselves onto barges and trucks and headed to D.C. And then they traveled um, from D.C. up through Montgomery County, Frederick County, and then pretty much taking the National Road West. Uh, this was something that the Marine Corps had been doing for a few years at that time. It began in 1921. And after World War I, Blackjack Pershing had been so impressed by the Marines' performance during that war that he wanted them in the Army. He was pushing to have the Marines disbanded and have the Marines rolled into the Army, even though that's not that the most likely place they would have been would have been the Navy, because they are, they are actually a branch of the Navy. So there were a couple of Marine generals who may recognize their names, General Lejeune and Butler, diehard Marines. And they wanted to preserve the Marine Corps. So they set up uh, a way to do that. It was part of public relations and part uh, just a way to achieve their summer maneuvers that they would do every year. But usually for summer maneuvers, they'd go to some isolated place where they could fight, uh, and um, that would be that. But what they started doing in 1921 was traveling to Civil War battlefields because the battlefields at the time uh, were under the control of the War Department. So they could actually go on to the battlefields and do maneuvers. And so they would travel uh, each night when they stopped, they would invite the public in and show off their equipment, show uh, off their weapons, show films of them during the march and films from uh, newsreels from World War I. And then when they got to the battlefield, they would, uh, you know, they actually had to take classes, part of their summer maneuvers, but then they would reenact the Civil War battle that was fought on that battlefield. And then they would fight it a modern 1920s era style. So when they were traveling, they were bringing a ton of equipment. And um, they did pretty good uh, coming up through Frederick County. They had traveled that way before in 1922 to go to Gettysburg. But as they tried to come west and come over South Mountain, they ran into problems. And um, one difference between, by the time 1924 events rolled around, was they were allowing the Marines to travel in trucks. Uh, up to then, the previous three years, they had had to march through the whole room. So um, they were loaded onto these trucks to come up over South Mountain, and the trucks just couldn't make it. They had to get the Marines out, um, in some cases having to push the trucks over the mountain, uh, but um, just basically to lighten the load as much as possible to make it easier to get up and over. And then they came down and uh, camped out on the um, battlefield at Sharpsburg. And when the uh, anniversary for the Battle of Antietam came that year, they reenacted the battle. And um, they also, they had about 25, no, 50,000 people had come out to see that, including any Civil War veterans they could find uh, who were in the area. And they had some interesting reunions between the uh, Confederates, 
and Union soldiers who were still alive. Um, they weren't so much sniping at each other. These old veterans were critiquing the Marines, saying, you know, how soft they were and how, you know, they would have marched all the way from Quantico and, and that uh, if they had, you know, that equipment, they would have been able to, you know, do this or that. And um, so they, they were really giving the Marines a hard time. But the Marines, they fought the, the battle uh, as if it was a Civil War battle. And then after the anniversary uh, events, they fought it 1924 style. So they bring out their tanks, they bring out machine guns with live ammunition because they needed the live ammunition so they could see the tracer bullets and know where they were shooting. Uh, they had um, signal balloons up in the air with people in them to, to direct. You know, anything that they would have used in the 20s, they were fighting it that way. Uh, and you get some interesting uh, conflicts, you know, and some interesting outcomes when you're doing it that way. So here's a couple shots. You can see uh, part of the encampment there. Um, some of the soldiers playing dead. What was interesting, I did, um, I did a book about the event at Gettysburg because the Gettysburg one led to the last line of duty deaths at the battlefield in Gettysburg because one of the planes crashed on the battlefield. And because they were doing sanctioned maneuvers, they are considered line of duty deaths. But um, in researching that, my co-author and I found a picture that had been labeled as a picture from the Battle of Gettysburg. And when you look at it, you can see it's a road. You can see a monument in the background, and then all these Marines draped over the side of the road playing dead. So it's obviously not the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, it, was, it was a shot from this 1922 reenactment. Couple, couple more shots you can see. Uh, they're still wearing those Doughboy helmets. You've got the, uh, the balloons and another battle shot. So they would use, when they were doing the Civil War reenactment part of it, they would do things like boiling meats to simulate blood on wounded soldiers. Uh, they used bags of flour as mortar rounds. So when they hit the ground and exploded, you have simulated smoke from the flour. So they were pretty handy about the way they did it. <coughs> but this was the last Marines only event that they did um, when the ses or when the 75th anniversaries of a lot of the battles started rolling around in the 30s, the Marines and the Army actually did a series of similar events. But um, 1921 through 24 were the years that they were Marine only and that they were here. So these aren't uh, these aren't from Hagerstown actually, but similar things were done in Hagerstown in the early part of the 20th century. People loved their daredevils, uh, and it was it was exciting. It was thrilling. How many of you remember Evil Knievel? Yeah, yeah. Um, so these were the early 20th century Evil Knievels. These guys would uh, come into town, sponsored by a local civic organization, and they would scale tall buildings uh, with their bare hands, 
And look how they're dressed. They would scale the buildings like that in shirt and tie and, and a hat as well. Um, so, uh, I mean, those, those shoes do not look good for trying to get yeah. a toehold. And, of course, they would do stunts like these guys are doing. Uh, one guy in Hagerstown, one of his stunts was he did a handstand on the front of a car. His car traveled down the street about 15 miles an hour. Then it stops suddenly. And he it throws him off into the air. He does a couple flips and lands in front of the car without being hit or hurt. But it was dangerous, as you can imagine. And in fact, in 1924, a couple weeks after a man named George Oakley uh, performed here in Hagerstown, he went up to Chambersburg and was trying to scale the uh, five-story bank building there. And he used, when he scaled buildings, he used a cane and a knitter tube. And while he was scaling the outside of these buildings, his inner tube snapped and he plunged his death. He didn't die right away. Uh, he had a ton of broken bones. They took him to the hospital and he just suffered for about 16 hours before he finally died. And that scared the uh, city council here so much that uh, they canceled any future uh, daredevil uh, shows, at least for a few years. But, it, you know, it was a great draw. It was a great way for these civic organizations to raise money. Uh, they drew big crowds. Uh, I mean, you can see why. I mean, who wouldn't come out to see guys standing on chairs like that? Um, so, in, uh, they were called uh, human spiders or human flies, were the two uh, popular terms. So this gentleman is um, George Cox, or Jacob Cox, excuse me. And he would, I guess you'd call him an activist for uh, trying to make sure, initially to try to make sure veterans got, uh, you know, the proper benefits, the unemployed got work. And he was a populist sort of activist. He started uh, in, the, in 1894 uh, from Ohio. He started this march. And as he's, and his intent, stated goal, was to come to D.C. and deliver his list of grievances to Congress. But as he's marching, his message is resounding with uh, unemployed uh, workers and veterans. And so his group just kept growing the more they marched through Ohio, then Western Maryland. Uh, and so it was called, as it grew, the group was called Coxie's Army. However, there was one place where Coxie's Army became Coxie's Navy. And that was. Uh, in Allegheny County and Washington County. As they were coming through Western Maryland, all those mountains they're going up and down are slowing them down, and they're realizing their goal to hit uh, DC by mid-April, or yeah, by mid-April, was in danger. So they needed a way to speed up. So arrangements were made. They essentially rented two canal boats, loaded everybody onto the canal boats, renamed them uh, in honor of Coxie, and went down the canal. Uh, they came into Hancock and um, got off there. And every night when they would stop, they would have people going out to essentially 
preaching their message, you know, talking about their message, gathering more supporters and bringing in more money so that they could continue their journey. Well, they had had a problem earlier on their journey and Coxie, who actually did not travel with his group, uh, had appointed somebody to beat them. And there was a slight coup that happened during the journey, and somebody else tried to take over the group. And when Coxie found out, he came in, set things right, kind of banished the people who had tried to uh, commit this coup. Well, those people had hurried up ahead of Coxie's army, and they'd come into Hancock uh, and acted like they were still part of the group. They had collected money uh, and moved on to the next town. So when the real Coxie's army comes in on the canal boats, essentially people are tapped out. They've already given to the cause. And so uh, um, they tried to get the, uh, they set the Washington County Sheriff on that group of people to see if they could catch them. And uh, I don't think they ever did manage to catch them. But um, from Hancock, the group continued, the Navy continued down the canal to Williamsport. And at Williamsport, they uh, disembarked and rebuilt wagons that they'd been using and started uh, along the National Road heading towards DC. They ran into a little trouble because it was a toll road and the toll booth collector was a um, very good at his job. He was not going to let them pass without paying the toll for every <laughs> person in that group. And they tried to convince him to, to let him come by for, you know, to, because he would be supporting, you know, workers like him and all. And um, he was vehement. And so they wound up having to pay the toll uh, to continue on. And then they, uh, they did make it to D.C. Uh, in time. And as they entered the city limits, the police arrested them. So they never did get to put their, um, their grievances before Congress. They were, they were worried. Uh, I think Congress was kind of worried that this was an armed uh, army, a true army coming to uh, unseat them. And so they had, they sicked the police on them. But here's a shot of Coxie. Uh, there's a shot of the canal boats they, uh, they rented. Here's the group on the road. You can see it was kind of a mishmash of marchers, wagons, bikes, horses, whatever. Uh, there were some women among the group, but it was primarily men. Who were on the journey and for the most part they were they were well behaved they did not act like uh, you know uh, a group that would riot or anything they they had some problems with uh, a little bit of drunken disorderly on occasion um, but um, generally a peaceful group Does anybody recognize her? Very big um, unsolved murder case here, more recent. Uh, and her name was Betty Jane Kennedy. And on April 4th, 1946, a farmer who lived on the Pennsylvania side of the Mason-Dixon line uh, above Washington County, found her body laying face down against a log at the bottom of an embankment. Um, she was only wearing a pink slip. She didn't have any shoes, anything like that, any identification at first. Um, he'd actually noticed, he wouldn't have noticed her because she was down the side of the embankment, <clears throat> except that he saw her coat uh, slung over a bush and that caught his attention. And when he went to get the coat, he sees the body. So the body was eventually identified. Um, 
through uh, labels in the clothing uh, to be Betty Jane Kennedy from Hagerstown. She was a 19 year old waitress here. And she'd been missing at that point for five days. Uh, she'd last been seen leaving work um, after an argument with an older sister. And next time anybody saw her was uh, when on that embankment. So this launched a investigation that continued to grow because of the lack of solid leads. And because it was Pennsylvania and Maryland, and you wound up with a lot of different police agencies being involved. Um, you had state police on Maryland, Pennsylvania, you had county sheriffs on both sides, um, local police agencies, uh, and I think even the FBI at one point was, uh, got involved. And they followed up every lead they could. Uh, there were su suspects, uh, a cab driver who was supposed to have picked her up. Um, there was uh, a rumor that went around that this crazy military prisoner had escaped. And they knew this guy had escaped Washington imprisonment. And he was thought to have been headed to Washington County. So some people thought maybe she met up with him and then got killed. Um, he actually turned up later you know, somewhere in the South. Um, and they, they questioned over a thousand people trying to find out what had happened to this girl. Uh, they did eventually find a purse of hers about a mile away from where her body was found. Uh, some shoes that were found that were believed to be hers as well, uh, pretty far away from the body. Um, but no one was ever uh, charged or convicted of her murder, and it remains one of the, the big unsolved cases of Washington County. So these are the gallows that used to be at the jail. And <clears throat> Christmas Eve, 1915, a man named John Brown uh, approached this house at Mount Briar, and he shot into the house, wound up killing a woman, 76-year-old widow named Susan Dixon. and. Uh, he thought he was actually shooting at someone else, um, but that person was not in the house, and he was seen near creeping around the house, and so he was identified, arrested, and convicted of murder uh, and sentenced to hang. So he actually became the last hanging in the county. Um, Later on, well, it would have been the following year, 1916. And uh, at that point, Washington County did not have a lot of official hangings. Um, this one, this last one, had been only the third official hanging in the county since the Civil War. So it wasn't a common practice here, as it might have been in other places. And after this hanging, uh, the gallows were actually dismantled for years. And then they decided to reassemble them uh, in the 1960s, put on kind of like a historical display there. But uh, you know, it unsettled people to see it. <laughs> and so they eventually dissembled it again and uh, uh, haven't put it up since. But this is a shot from one of its final years uh, in operation. So yeah, the county can be proud they did not hang a lot of people. Yeah. 
On the other hand, this county was notorious for moonshine. <laughs> At one point, informants were telling the state police in the area that north of Hagerstown in the county, uh, there were 500 different stills. That's just north of Hagerstown. Who knows how much <laughs> south of Hagerstown? Um, <coughs> Smithsburg had its own little moonshining war uh, between some of the moonshining families. Uh, they actually wound up um, blowing up some buildings, burning buildings, a couple of people got killed. So it was a very competitive practice uh, up in the north end of the town. And one of the major reasons for that was Penmar with all its resorts, but even all those tourists, uh, a lot of those tourists, you know, got thirsty. And so they would come in and uh, the moonshiners uh, would have little traveling stands, so to speak. Uh, one report said that uh, someone would walk out from one of the resorts uh, just doing a casually, casual walk. And they would come upon somebody who had a little table set with <laughs> pints of moonshine on it, selling it. And the guy, once he sold out, he pulled up that table, disappear into the woods. <laughs> and about an hour, hour and a half later, he reappears somewhere else nearby with a whole new fresh stock of, of booze. And he'd be selling it. And, um, They'd sell, in this area, they said a pint would sell for about $16 at a time uh, pre-prohibition when you could get it for about, you know, a dollar to two dollars a pint. So it was very profitable. Um, a lot of people went into that business. Uh, it also helped support a lot of farmers who were finding markets for their corn didn't have to worry about any excess corn uh, crop going to waste. Um, and there were scammers even among the moonshiners. There's one great story uh, from up around Penmar. These guys thought they uh, got a deal. They came across a moonshiner who was selling pints of moonshine for just $3 a pint. They thought, great deal. So they bought up some pints. They went off to enjoy them. Turned out it was muddy water. <laughs> and of course, they go back and that moonshiner is gone. So. And they can't make much of a complaint about it because <laughs> uh, it was illegal. Um, up in Cascade, uh, in 1925, there was uh, one moonshiner who was holding off revenue agents uh, with a shotgun, uh, trying to protect his 30 gallon still. <laughs> And they finally eventually got him so surrounded with police and revenue agents that he gave himself up. So it's, um, yeah, it was it was big business here in town. Uh, and also, you know, he had uh, South Mountain. That was, I mean, having the mountains, that becomes a great place to hide in China. So that's probably where the bulk of the stills were hidden. But then you also had, it was a family business. I mean, a lot of people, bathtub gin, have you heard that term before? Because a lot of people were making moonshine just for their own personal consumption in their homes. And uh, you know, they'd, make, uh, they'd make it in their basements or, or their barns and hope nobody told them. <laughs> Here's a shot of one of those resorts where, um, so this supplied a lot of the business to moonshiners. I mean, you can see a lot of rooms there, a lot of potential customers for the moonshiners. This is uh, Blue Mountain Lodge. Another shot of skills. Put that in close. So does anyone know what this is? Alligaster. Alligaster, yes. <laughs> My son's favorite story. From the book. Um, and Snallygaster uh, is not an original term for this area, 
but the original Snallygaster, uh, German in origin, did not look anything like this. <laughs> and the Snallygaster first appeared, made his first appearance, or her first appearance, as it turned out, in 1909. And the Middletown Register people woke up that uh, morning in February, read their paper, front page story, talking about the Snallygaster and how it had uh, picked up a cow, drained it of blood, and um, nearly killed another person. And that just, I guess that was the 1909 version of going viral. I mean, people picked up on that story all over the place, and they got <coughs> word, and other sightings started coming in. Um, it just, it caught on, and you can see the descriptions all seem to be fairly similar. Here's a couple of the drawings from some of the descriptions. So kind of amazing that something like that could go unnoticed, uh, except on a few occasions. But apparently uh, that's what's happening. Um, there were sightings made as far west as Cumberland, um, down to places like Shepherdstown, Martinsburg, and as far north as Emmitsburg. Now, at one point, and at one point uh, President Teddy Roosevelt, by the way, check out my shirt here. Oh my, my new shirt. But anyway, there was, at one point, <laughs> President Roosevelt was going to come to the county and hunt the Stallion. Yes. Uh, that was Smithsonian was uh, had expressed interest in was telling people that uh, they wanted to send a research group here to try and find the Stallion. Yes. One person. Um, thought he caught the Snallygaster, and he was charging people to come see it. And he had it captured in his basement, supposedly. They came to see it, and they had put the picture in what it looked like. Yes, that's what it was. He had captured a wounded Canadian act, which, granted, they're pretty big, uh, and if they're ticked off, they can look pretty fearsome, but not Snallygaster. <laughs> and as the stories spread, things were added. Uh, when the report from Cumberland came in about the Snallygaster, it was said that it could speak, and that it was apparently like a reincarnated Civil War soldier. Because he told this person that, why, he was thirsty. He hadn't had a drink since the Battle of Chickamauga. So maybe the person who reported it was one of the uh, moonshiners. <laughs> In Emmitsburg, the Snallygaster displayed another talent. It could breathe fire. Uh, the paper up there reported that um, it had swooped down, picked up a guy who worked for the Emmitsburg Railroad. Um, luckily for this guy, it had picked him up by his suspenders, and his suspenders popped, so he fell to the ground. Uh, a mob surrounded the Snallygaster, and the Snallygaster started breathing fire at them, and the mob decided they weren't so interested in catching him. Now, I have discovered in the interim that at least that story came from a group of men in that area that were friends with the editor of the Emmitsburg Chronicle, and they would just make up stories. <laughs> Great stories. I mean, they're, they're fun stories to read, but you gotta, but you have to see who's involved in the stories, and you start to recognize the names and realize, okay, this is that group of guys who, who just makes up things, and they make up some wild ones. But they were all printed in this paper as legit, and some of them were picked up in other newspapers as well. Uh, you know, early UFO sightings uh, that they had in Emmitsburg were picked up in multiple papers from this group. 
so. So that one at least easily discounted. But that was the last sighting in 1909 of the scouting nest. And the sightings died off until 1932. All of a sudden, the reports start popping up again. And, um, you know, there's, there's talk of now that uh, people thinking that maybe it's not the same snallygaster, maybe that the first snallygaster had, had laid an egg, and that for some reason the snallygaster egg takes 23 years to hatch. Um, but, uh, you know, they're starting, the, the reports get start going viral until December 21st of 32. When the Stalligaster sadly met its end in one south mountain. Apparently it was flying over a still in on the mountain. And the the smells or the fumes from the mash uh, the mash bats wafted up and overcame the Stalligaster. <laughs> and it fell into the bat. And because the bat had lye in it, it wound up eventually dissolving the flesh off the bones. And this all happened right at the same time, conveniently, that the Washington County Sheriff and Revenue Agents were getting ready to raid that stuff. <laughs> it wasn't that convenient. Uh, because they saw the Snallygaster, and they were, they were quoted in the Herald Mail about what they'd seen. Uh, not that they kept the bones after they've been uh, stripped, because they they were diligent officers of the law, so they blew up the mash bats, and of course they blew the bones up with it. So the Snallygaster was no more, and that was the last sighting of the Snallygaster here, and it's in uh, here uh, in the county. Uh, by getting drunk and falling into <laughs> a 2,500-gallon mash bag. <laughs> so Washington County is the earthquake capital of Western Maryland. From uh, over 200 people, 50 years uh, that they've been tracked or at least marking earthquakes in this area. There have been 61 recorded earthquakes in Maryland, about one every four years. Uh, some, you know, most of them weren't very severe at all. Uh, a lot of them actually predated the Richter scale, but uh, most of them measured under 3.0 on the Richter scale. But if you look west of Carroll County, there's only two reported earthquakes, and they're both near Hancock. So Hancock is actually an earthquake capital. The first was September 7, 1962. Uh, 2 p.m., um, they registered 3.3 on the Richter scale. Uh, so not, not very severe, but enough to make people sit up and take notice. The next one was at 7.30 p.m. on April 26, 1978. And uh, that one was 3.1 on the Richter scale. So they, you know, other than rattling, shaking people up, they didn't really cause any damage. But they are the only reported earthquakes uh, in Western Maryland, as you can see. And, you know, to give you an idea of Richter scale is on a 10.0 measurement, and the famous San Francisco earthquake 1903, that was 8.3. So 3.0, not much to, to uh, worry about. However, Home Facts estimates that there's a chance of a 5.0 earthquake in Western Maryland in the next 50 years. <laughs> However, it's only a 0.84% chance. So <laughs> don't worry too much about it. You're safe. You don't need to have the uh, 
the earthquake proof buildings like they do in California. And that's because we don't have any fault lines running through the city. So in 1932, Hagerstown became, well, in the 30s, Hagerstown became famous for having the world's only white frog common. So this is what a albino frog kind of looks like. So a man named C.C. Moeller, he was at Lily Ponds. Uh, and um, at the time, Lily Ponds uh, you know, was starting to, to do plants, still known for goldfish. Uh, but he noticed in some of the ponds these white spots at the bottom of the pond on the edge. So he got curious, looked down um, to see what they were. Turned out they were tadpoles. So he bought as many of these tadpoles as he could find. And he brought them uh, to his home in Hagerstown. He started raising them and breeding them. And um, as his collection, as his colony grew, he expanded. He bought some property uh, and had in-ground pools or in-ground ponds dug that he could put them in. And I uh, started, as you saw in the other picture, he would charge people to come see them. Uh, he would also donate them to uh, museums uh, because they were very rare, especially in the, the numbers that he was, he had them. And um, you know, so he brought Hagerstown a little bit of fame uh, although it's not, I guess, this colony did not naturally occur here. It was transplanted here, but um, you know, uh, he made a name for himself, uh, kind of, I guess, kind of almost like a Barnum, looking for those oddities. Uh, and that was his oddity right there. Here's an old shot of Fort Ritchie. Mm -hmm. And um, Fort Ritchie, I mean, you guys know World War One, World War II history for the area. Um, played a big part with intelligence gathering during World War II. The Ritchie Boys, of course, very famous from the area. Uh, however, there was a time that a single woodpecker brought all activity to a stop in the camp. Um, very determined to the paper. Uh, the, the paper, hey, the Herald Mail, Morning Herald said, uh, quote, one woodpecker was so diligent in his attack on a pole that the first hard gust of wind the other day sent it crashing to the ground. And when it went crashing to the ground, it took all the wires attached to it, <laughs> and so the entire camp lost power. <laughs> Uh, this was in 1948, so at least it wasn't in the middle of the war. But uh, for all their security and uh, you know, intelligence gathering and stuff that's done up at that camp, uh, the classified stuff associated with Site R, uh, one woodpecker brought them down for a day. So, uh, very, uh, I don't know, ironic, I guess would be the word, um, but a story I like just to show uh, nature versus man, nature can still conquer us. So those are just a few of the, the little known stories of the county that I wanted to share with you. Uh, hope you enjoyed them. Um, yes. You guys have any questions or comments? Always looking for more stories. If you want to send me any more, uh, happy to hear them. Yes, ma'am. Does the white frog colony still exist? 